Jimmy D and the Wolf Podcast. Hello, Mr. Walter. Yes, Mr. Davis. How's Hello. it going, man? You know, today's been a pretty good week. I've been grinding it out and uh, rededicated myself to uh, some serious guitar practice. My goal is to practice 10 hours a week. Might not seem like a lot, but that's yeah, that's a great that's a great goal. It's hard to get that much in, you know. It's uh, but no, ten uh, hours a week that's a lot of guitar. I mean, we're talking practice, learning on new new skills and things. And I mean, I really got derailed when I came to Nashville because uh, one of the first producers I worked with, you know, this story, told me that my licks were grade school level. He had ulterior motives for saying that. He wanted to actually, uh, he he didn't realize that I was the one playing the guitar, and he thought he would wanted me to be, he wanted to be my producer and produce yeah. the track for me, and uh, he thought by insulting the production that I would come his way, but he didn't realize that the guy sitting right next to him was the guy playing the guitar. And then when he realized that, he didn't even apologize. He's just like, oh. Yeah. Asshole. Yeah. Sorry. There's this is a PG podcast. <laughs> we try, don't we? Uh, yeah, so. and, and there's just so many players there, man. There's so many incredible guitar players in Nashville that it's. Oh, yeah, sure. It's... Yeah, did you see the, the CMAs? Uh, I didn't know any of the names. There were uh, Musician of the Year. There were there were some musician Musician of the Year the winner was a female fiddle player and there were, I think three or four, uh, let's see if I can find it. Three or four, uh, guitar players, CMA awards, 2020. You might know some of these names. Let's see. I didn't even watch it this year. It's a shame. Well, I've, I've never watched it. I should have new artists. Of the, let's see. Uh, Musician of the year, Paul Franklin. Of course, he's probably uh, on steel guitar. He's probably nominated every year. Yeah, yeah. Rob McNelly, sure. guitar. You know, you know that name. Yeah. Ilya, Ilya Toshinishki, Toshinishki, guitar, and Derek Wells, guitar, were the were the five that were nom nominated. I don't even know who <laughs> half those people are. But you know the Rob McNally name? Oh, sure. But Derek Well and Ilya Toshininsky, you didn't know? No. Rob well, was uh, uh, Seeger's guitarist for a long time. Okay. Turbo well, Bob Seeger. was Paul Franklin because that's my main instrument, pedal steel. No, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, he's like the Bruce Lee of pedal steel guitar too, man. Yeah. There's nothing... There's really nobody even compare Paul Franklin to. Yeah. He's like Jordan esque on the pedal still. Yeah. 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 It's frustrating to try to play one too, man, because when you watch other pedal still players, it looks so simple. I love playing it. I mean, I, uh, I mean, I just love playing playing it i mean i'm not a virtuoso by any stretch of the of the of the, the meaning of the word virtuoso but it's a lot of fun to play and i yeah. have one in my studio in fact you can see it i can see it right behind me with a bunch of papers on it mm -hmm. <laughs> the red thing there it's got a cover on it that's my pedal steel some of my favorite stuff is the pedal still playing on the old hank williams senior songs man it's just crying whining pedal still that's some great stuff mm -hmm. and yeah. i would imagine at the time it was happening that that was probably some pretty space age stuff that guy was doing yeah it has its own unique sound but it kind of fell out of favor i mean i think pedal steel about the same time that the 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 big, the uh, the upright bass, uh, because I remember there was a there was a pastor, or uh, the Lundstrom. Anyone from South Dakota will, and a church person will remember the Lundstroms. Lowell Lundstrom was a traveling 
musical family evangelist. And when he first started, I think I still have the card. He had his brother played upright bass because he, he was a country player. He had, he had uh, been playing in bars and, and then he had a salvation experience and he left it all there behind. And he, he started doing that kind of music in churches and he had a pedal steel player back in the day. And I have a card, I still have it somewhere of one of the early uh, Lowell Lundstrom things where he had his brother playing upright bass, the big box bass, and uh, and he had a pedal steel player, but it wasn't much longer. And his brother was playing electric bass and there was no pedal steel player. Yeah. I think pedal steel kind of became not cool in mainstream country. Maybe right. in the now it's everywhere again. Yeah, well, you got guys like Robert Randolph. They're just taking it outside. Uh, I love Robert Randolph. I follow him on Instagram. I see his posts almost every day. Uh, grew up in the in the uh, Black Pentecostal church, so his approach is definitely not country. You know, yeah, so. lots of distortion and stuff yeah. on it. Wah wah pedal and all kinds of stuff that you know the those those old school country guys don't like that. You know that's. That's yeah, you always, way. you always have the purists that say if it doesn't sound exactly like it did fifty years ago. It's a frustrating thing with blues, man. It's like if it doesn't sound like Muddy Waters, and you have the purists that'll say that's not blues. And usually, the ones that scream that the loudest are the ones that can't play an instrument. <laughs> you know, they're always they're always the self proclaimed experts on it. I think it's the same thing with when it comes to jazz. I mean, jazz musicians complain that the only the golden age of jazz, which was in the 50s and maybe the 60s, you know, when all, you know, Coltrane and uh, Miles Davis and and uh, Bill Evans and so many of those those guys from back in back in the day and uh, Bird, you know, yeah, the bebop era. And that's what a lot of people think. If it doesn't sound like that, it's not pure jazz. And you got right. phenomenal, phenomenal. There's a guy. Uh, there's a guy who plays B3 organ. Matt, the uh, keyboard player at church, uh, told me about him. Corey. Corey, I was w watching. He's from Snarky P Puppy. He plays with Snarky Puppy and a bunch of other things. Corey Henry is a B3 yeah. player. Uh, grew up in the church. Still plays in the church, but he um, he's in Snarky Puppy. Have you, have you listened to much of their stuff? I mean, they're amazing. Yeah, man, I, I did I did a gig with uh, Bob Bob Lanzetti, the guitar player for Snarky Puppy. I did a gig with him last December here in Madison. Wow. Yeah, I mean, he was his girlfriend's from here. Really, from Madison? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if they're still together or not, but yeah. He wow. dates a, a local doctor's daughter. Wow. Yeah. Madison just keeps punching above your weight. You just, uh, you know. We do pretty good with what we've got. <laughs> but no, it was a blast of a gig. We played all kinds of like Neil Young and Hendrix and stuff like that. We didn't have a list. We just kind of winged it. He's a great guy. Great player too, man. Yeah, Snarky Puppy's amazing. I think they won a Grammy. Probably one of those. Uh, I wouldn't Grammys be. That, one of the non televised Grammys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like some of the best musicians, they win Grammys and you don't even know that it's like a. That they even have a Grammy for that. Like you never see who wins the Blues Grammy or any of that stuff. They've won, they've won three, according to this. They won in 2014 for R&B Performance. They won in 2018 for Contemporary Instrumental Album. And they won in 2017 for Contemporary Instrumental Album. So two years in a row, they got that category. I mean, they're some of the best musicians uh, in the U.S., I think. Sure. Now, I mean, there are many, many great musicians, but they're some of the, they're really right up oh, there. Oh, yeah, those guys are incredible. So, yeah, so partially due to your your urging and your playing on the B3 on your and locally there, 
Have you ever played your guitar through it yet? Have you? I'm going back tonight, man. That's going to happen tonight. But I've been really, really happy with everything that's happened so far. You know, B3, for those of you, our, our, our two viewers that we have right now, welcome. <laughs> B3 organ is, is an organ that rotates, the speaker rotates. Yeah. True B3 has speaker, or Leslie. I'm misspeaking. The Leslie speaker, which came with a B3, but it's a separate, uh, is where the it's got a horn that rotates, and then it's got a bass speaker that rotates, and that gives you the Doppler effect, like when a train comes by and the pitch goes up as it comes near you and, go, and goes down. You know, that's called the Doppler effect, which maybe you learned in school, which I did. Remember when I learned that, in, I think, in high school, or maybe Doppler effect. It sounds so cool. I think it's named after a guy named Doppler. Anyway, so the rotating speaker gives you that kind of a sound. And uh, um, the Leslie definitely was a key part of that sound. And uh, But you can also put an or uh, a guitar through it. Like Hendrix, Hendrix did on Little Wing. You know, so, um, so I ordered a, uh, a brand new Leslie speaker. Should be coming in within the next week. I'm going to have it in my studio and it's not the full size ones that are like 800 pounds. It's only, it weighs 80 pounds. Uh, what does a full size Leslie speaker weigh? Probably. Dude, two. I, I would guess 350 pounds, you know, and they used to lug those, those things. If you had a B3 organist in your band or maybe even still he'd want he, his, if he's going to have his gear there, he needs his Leslie speaker, and you got to lug that in. And even the to be three organ itself isn't too light either. I don't think. Have you ever moved one of those? Oh yeah, I've moved the B three and the Leslie before. How much does the B three weigh? It's it's about six people heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And imagine every gig, right? Well, the keyboard player that's his that's his gear. Versus, yeah, you know, man. the guitar player or even yeah, a, a horn player. Imagine you got a trumpet player. All he's got to bring in is this tiny little case. That's all he needs. Like singers, man. We used to get so what mad when I, when I started kind of having bands as a teenager. We, we never liked the singer. Before I started singing, we would be so mad because it was like they'd show up with a microphone and never help move gear. It just creates forever bad blood. You know what I mean? I don't miss those days. Not even, not even helping with the gear. Uh -oh. Yeah, most of the singers we had were like that. And so um, I got wise and started doing solo acts, and now I move all the gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I played in. in I know them, didn't I? I? I played in a band in South Dakota where we had this guy who joined us for a while and subbing in. Uh, Dennis and he he didn't help move any gear. I think he he said he was too old. He said that's a surefire way to weaken your spot in a band. Yeah, don't help carry things. No, yeah, because there's a lot of gear to move back and forth, you know. And then you add more, and you got a light show, and you got the speakers and the board yeah. and, and the and mounter. If, if you don't help move gear the first time somebody suggests you get kicked out of the band, it's not going to be hard to convince everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's like, yeah, we'll get somebody that doesn't play as well. That works harder. I was always told when I got started that that's, that's the part you get paid for. You play for free and they pay you to lug equipment around. <laughs> and I believe it's true. It's been my experience, at least. You play for free, and you get paid for moving your gear around. Yeah, you get paid to drive to the show and to move gear. Well, I'm, you know, as I told you, we're probably going to get a van. And I talked to the guy today. I, I'd forgotten I have my credit. Uh, I'm going to try to buy it on uh, payments, get a loan on it rather than pay cash. I could pay cash, but I think I'll just get the loan to serve the cash. And, uh, Diesel, diesel van. Um, they call it uh, Sprinter, Sprinter class van. Dodge. It's a Dodge, but uh, 
A Mercedes-Benz also has a Sprinter, but a Mercedes-Benz is really expensive. This is has a Mercedes-Benz diesel engine in it, the one I'm looking at, and uh, I'll convert it to a, uh, you know, a bunk. I, I saw one online for sale, uh, same size, and it had five bunks in it and for traveling musicians. Of course, that particular one, I think they wanted 40 or 50 grand for. This one's an older one, but it was less than 100,000 miles of a diesel engine, so we're gonna have to do a lot of gigging to wear it out. That's our that's our goal, Jimmy. Next year, wear, we'll... wear out a whole diesel engine in one year? <laughs> Not one year, no. Just wear it out. Wear it out in uh, our careers. That'll be yeah. hard. It won't be that easy. Yeah, those you know, things are indestructible. Three, four hundred thousand miles, maybe. I like it. Does Toyota make a diesel? They don't. I'm sure they do probably yeah. do. Got that Toyota work truck, which is working hard. No, that's why I asked because Toyotas always last forever. If they make a diesel, they probably get five million miles or something. <laughs> yeah, well, this particular truck, if I end up getting it, somebody might buy it out for me. We'll see. While I'm messing around trying to get my credit unfreezed, I forgot that my credit was freezed, frozen, which is, I think, an important thing to do, you know, so that people just can't, people can't steal your identity then because. They can't access your credit. So nobody can get my credit report unless I unfreeze it. And so I've forgotten. Every time I try to get a loan, I need, I, what's that? You need to freeze your credit, man. Yeah, I do. If you're not doing that, it's free. Just There's three credit rating agencies, Equifax and Experian and I can't remember the other one. You have to do it individually with all three. You can't just go to one place that I know of. And, and I mean, there are subscription services that help you with that and probably would help you freeze it. But you pay monthly for some kind of subscription service that monitors your credit. I think that's completely bogus because yeah. I use Credit Karma. My, my nephew turned me on to Credit Karma, which is a free app on my phone. And they give me updates all the time when my credit rating changes. It didn't cost a cent. So you don't definitely don't have to pay for credit monitoring, in my opinion. So, uh, but I'm going to have to unfreeze my credit so that they can get credit report and uh, prove me for this truck so that we can. And then we're going to have to rebuild it, take all the seats out of it. It's got, well, you saw it, the, the, the fabric on the seats. It's still got all the seats. It probably seats like 10 people. Yeah. And all the seats are still in there, but they were like, very loud and obnoxious. I can't even imagine that, that was even fashionable in 2006. This is it 2006? They're pretty funky. Pretty funky fabric. We should take the kids to the zoo before we take them out. <laughs> yeah. So take those out, put some bunks in there. And, um, you know, because I was looking at an RV first, but I'm so glad this would be so much better. RV would be so hard to park in front of venues. And imagine if you had a venue in a city trying to find a place to park a 35 foot RV. Ooh, mm -hmm. fuel. Oh man. Uh, a diesel, smaller van would be so much better. Um, yeah, I agree. But you know, the, 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 the dark, the black water and the gray water you know, and all that, having that in an RV. And then I was reading up on it. The black water is from the toilet. And you got to drain that, and the tanks aren't overly huge. I mean, if you use it a lot, you're going to fill it up, right? And then you got to find a way to drain it, and it could get plugged up, but you got to use single ploy toilet paper. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to deal with all this. And then I ran across, actually, I was watching, yeah, I was watching HGTV. So now I can make myself feel good about watching HGTV. Um, there were, there was a company that was doing, uh, mini homes or something, and they put this uh, this toilet in there that incinerates everything, including you know if you uh, including number one or number two liquid. It's it'll it'll incinerate it all down to like a couple tablespoons of ash. So like if you go on a two week tour, maybe you have to empty that once, and it's just ash. And so you have these liners, disposable liners that you have in the thing, and then when you're done, you hit flush, and that liner gets sucked into the chamber and it gets incinerated at a super high temperature, like 2000 degrees. It incinerates everything, including the liner, I suppose, and the toilet paper or whatever. And um, 
You need gas. You need propane hooked up to it, of course. Some sort of electrical, I suppose. And you, you, no black water. No need for black water. It's amazing. Why would anybody going forward, once this is invented and it seems to work properly, why would anybody even entertain messing with that black water? Yeah. Yeah, that's way better. I mean, I grew up on a farm. I know what I know what manure smells like. And you know, and you gotta empty it out. And I've seen picture videos of them empty it out, and it gets plugged a lot, and then you gotta deodorize it. And um, what a nasty, nasty thing just to have that. And then you run out of water, you gotta fill up the water again. Now, if you have gray water where you have water tanks for I mean, most RVs have three three tanks. They have fresh water, they have gray water, which is used dish sink water and shower water, which you can literally open the tap, one article I said, and let it run out, dribble out the back of your RV while you're driving down the road. I mean, it's just, you know, just the water that you use to wash your body or wash the wash the, the dishes. I, I, I'm, I'm not advising that, but apparently it's, you know, it's not, it's not toxic or anything. And then you got the black water, which you have to go into a particular dump spot and what an, I mean, you get to plug up and you got to find the right place to dump it. And I don't want to deal with all that. I'm just going to get the incinerator special. <laughs> I want an incinerator for my house. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you have a plumbing issue in your house? Oh man. I've had, there's always something with plumbing because there's like eight, eight or nine water maples in my yard. And then there's four or five at my mother's house. We own that house too. And water maples do two things. They provide shade. Well, they do three things. They provide shade. They bust water lines. <laughs> and they fill gutters. <laughs> And so I have an ongoing problem. And as long as we have that many water maples, it's always going to be an issue. Hmm. Every couple of years, man, I got to get in there and cut roots out and replace a section of line. And it's, I got to play the plumber. Yeah. Um, yeah. Plumbing is a serious thing. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I th that one RV I was looking at getting, I mean, it was a good deal, but it was an old RV. It was, uh, it only had, 65,000 miles on it. It was an old retired couple, couple, but the decor was, I think it was a nineties RV. If I remember had a generator and everything. I mean, another thing too, you know, having a generator cause you want 110 volt to plug in your phone and well, you can do that with 12 volt, but um, you know, microwave and all that other stuff. I would think today you would have just run it off, put a, put an alternator on your, on the, it's a diesel engine. It can take the load. And just have batteries, Tesla batteries. Do you know? Okay, talk about Tesla. Do you know what Tesla launched in the last few days? Tesla has launched a tequila. Really? Yeah. That seems kind of out of his wheelhouse a little bit. Well, you should see the bottle. The bottle is really cool, unique design, very sharp angles. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, he's apparently it's sold out. I mean, it sold out in a couple hour or two. I mean, the guy's got a brand. He's got he's got fans. I mean, he raised like when he came out with that futuristic looking pickup or uh, truck, which I thought was super ugly. All flat panels. Did you see that? For a hundred yeah. bucks, you could reserve a delivery of one like two years in the future. And just with that stint, he raised like thirty five million dollars. Everybody, people. Yeah, I, I, I like Elon. <laughs> oh, I like him too. I'm not dissing him. I'm just saying. He's a phenomenal businessman and marketer. I mean, you, you say, I'm going to come out with this product. I haven't finished designing it yet, or I don't even made it. But if you want to order it, you can reserve your spot. Just send me a hundred bucks. And there's no obligation that you have to buy it, or there's no obligation that I'm actually going to send it to you. But send me a hundred dollars. And he gets, thirty five. I think, $35 million raised from that. Now, that's a guy that's got a brand. and that's a guy. How many that's people can do that? Not too many, not too many. So he's got the brand awareness so he can do it. And so he launched a tequila based on what that article that I saw. And, um, you know, uh, he's a disruptor for sure. You know, I wonder yeah, why. He, 
He's moving too. Yeah. He's well, going he's to Texas. Texas. Oh yeah, yeah. He's moving to Texas. And uh, who else is moving? There was Rogan. Some, Rogan is moving to Texas too, or Florida. Is he moving to Florida or Texas? I'm not sure. It was Texas early on. Yeah. But there's a lot of them kind of getting out of California. Yeah. You know, well, it's like I don't know, I don't know about California, but New York City has been considered that it was going to die. And you know, a lot of taxes in New York City. I mean, you have a city t estate tax, a city, sorry, city income tax. When I lived in New York City and worked for Mitsui back in the day, you have a state income tax. Well, you have a federal income tax. You have a state income tax and you have a city income tax. I mean, you get taxed up to Wazoo. I think the tax rate is the highest in New York City of any of any municipality income tax on your on your income but yet and they're saying that um they're always saying new york is gonna is gonna crash and, but the draw of it i mean there's only one place like it and i was reading it all the other day i said new york ain't dead don't even think about it it's going in a it's going to change it's changing so it's, it's a renaissance but it it's coming back just as hot as ever so maybe the same thing with california or not i, I don't know california's a whole state it's not a city so, well, California uh, doesn't have the one dollar slices of pizza. It doesn't have the balance that New York has. When I was up here with a songwriter friend, it was like, dude, everything's so expensive, but they have these that you can get full <laughs> off of this one slice of pizza for a dollar. It's like the best pizza ever. <laughs> it's all about balance. <laughs> That's what New York is going for. I've lived there in years. I used to live there in the nineties. And I, I uh, that experience, I have very fond memories of that. I mean, I live in the Upper East Side. I'd move back in a heartbeat. I mean, it's yeah. super, I couldn't, I don't know if I could afford the apartment that I had back then. No. Yeah. A lot more money than what I was paying then. Yeah, it's probably about eight, eight grand a month now. Probably. I paid just under, I think I paid 900 a month for a efficiency. One big room, it was like 20 foot square, and then a kitchen and bathroom was off of it. And, uh, had a had a it was a fifth floor and it did have a an elevator so it wasn't a walk up but it was an old building pre war I think it was a pre war building um, elevator was so you know I usually took the stairs because the elevator was so slow you press the button and wait for it to come you could have already been to your apartment by the time I got there <laughs> driver driver right so right right I'd wait <laughs> or if I was really tired of course I'd wait for it but after a long day I'm like oh man I can't climb those stairs. But, uh, yeah, I mean. When you have to walk a lot in, in New York, too, man. You have to right. walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. It's great. Uh, it's great. I love I love walking the streets there. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's changed. I mean, it was on the 83rd and the east side, 83rd Street, um, between 3rd and Lex, Lexington. And now it's it's pushed up into you, know, you don't want to go above 90 because that was kind of the bad area. Now it's pushed up to 120. Uh, the gentrification is pushed up further north and north, north into Harlem and whatnot, and, uh, more expensive. Uh, so, but you know, live music and uh, recording studios. You know, back in the day, it used to be a haven for recording, but the real estate's so expensive that. All the recording studios are leaving. It's it's hard for music. You know, musicians, most musicians, unless you're in the 0.1%, uh, you struggle financially. So yeah. it's hard to, to you know, all the, there were a lot of great studios in in um, in New York City. I have the piano that was used in the studio that where they created uh, – uh, Kind of Blue, Miles Davis, the piano. Really? Thing. I have the digital representation of it. <laughs> oh. I was going to say, damn, you never told me that. <laughs> I have it on my, it's the digital representation. I was like, wow, man, you'd work. think you would have told me about that. but <laughs> Yeah, I don't know which studio it was, but it was in midtown Manhattan somewhere that they recorded that studio. I have to look that up. But um the day before they closed the studio, they were going to demolish everything. Uh, this particular company, small company that just does plugins, 
went in and recorded the basic, you know, every key, you know, hard, soft, you know, I don't know, there's different, yeah. and then you extrapolate between each one. That's how they do it. It's sampled. It's the way music is done on a computer. They sample it. It could be a horn. It could be a trombone. It could be a trumpet, any instrument. It's an actual instrument. I mean, there's two types of ways of having digital instrumentation. You can synthesize it where you have a synthesizer that tries to make it sound like a piano or a, whatever you're going after or a uh, horn. And they still haven't gotten to the point where, you know, by saying, well, this is what it sounds like. We're going to try to recreate that. But a much better way is to use samples where you actually have, like we have right. the, you, the horn section. We, we, we used it on one song. I remember what song I, I bought the, the horn. They had the studio musicians from in New York City come in and play all the horn parts and they've got all these different choices. Yeah, it's called uh, it's called blue uh, it might be called kind of blue it's the the, the setting it's kind of dark it's uh, I know I had my friend Mark here and he didn't like it he's a keyboard player he's a piano player he thought that particular keyboard which they actually sampled from the piano that was used on that kind of blue album which was the piano that was in the studio he thought it sounded too dark and so we found another one. I have, I have other other ones in there. Alicia Keys has a sample one, uh, her piano. She could buy that. I've always wanted to get that. I haven't gotten it. Whatever piano she has, she, it's the Alicia Keys special. Um, so you can have Alicia Keys piano in your in your studio for like a hundred bucks. That's about what those plugins cost, about a hundred dollars. And you have the sound of all these great, great. Uh, like a hundred bucks a piece. Hundred bucks per. What do you mean? Yeah, per software package. Is that what, is that what you're asking? Well, uh, no, like a package would have like the kind of blue piano and other. Well, no, I think I paid close to hundred dollars for the kind of blue piano, just oh. that. One. And I think what would uh, Alicia Keys be? What is hers? Uh, probably about a hundred bucks. Alicia Keys for Native Instruments, $99. Wow. That can get expensive. You go getting a bunch of patches. Well, that's the thing. Pat patches, that's the better term. Yeah. Um, you know, sign of an icon developed in cooperation with Alicia Keys herself. 17 gigabytes of samples, 12 velocity layers per key. So they have 12, 12 different velocities on each key. Um, Danish sample specialist Thurman Scarby. Oh, oh, I have some of his stuff, Scarby. Oh, yeah, I have some of his stuff that I really like. An impulse response expert, Ernest Chalakis, created a virtual piano that meets her professional standards and embodies the soulful sound that has become her trademark as a superstar. This is the piano sound that has helped Miss Keys win multiple Grammys and reach the top of the charts. So, you know, uh, $99, you could have Alicia's piano in your studio yeah so that's about what they go i think um i'm pretty sure the the one is called uh, i know it's blue I think it's kind of blue in it um let me just check it the one, one great that, album um oh yeah i listen to that almost every week my sunday afternoon chill um Piano in Blue, that's what it's called. It's called Piano in Blue, is the name of the samples. It's from Cine Samples. And it's, what? Oh, it's only 49 bucks. Wow. Miles Alicia Keys stuff costs more than Miles stuff. <laughs> Garbage. Who knows? Who even knows? It's 99. They reduced it to 49. Man, I got ripped off because I think I paid 99. Man. What a jip. 
<laughs> oh man, you can, uh, you know, it's, it's a problem. You, especially come, I usually wait to buy samples on black Friday time, which is coming up, you know, which mm -hmm. is a couple more weeks now. And that's when all the software did the uh, recording software plugin guys reduce their prices. And, um, because it doesn't cost them anything, right? Each right. of the details doesn't cost a penny because they've already developed the software. All they have to do is deliver it to you. So whatever costs for them to have Wi-Fi or whatever, which is probably they already have it. So there's no additional cost. 100% of every sale is profit on this type of a thing. So, you know, they can have 70% off, you know. Maybe the Piano Blue is probably a Black Friday sale at 49. That's probably what that is. It's probably because I see a lot of emails that are already marked stuff down and trying to get the sales going ahead of time. Yeah, but we keep threatening. We keep threatening to upgrade our phones on Black Friday to see what kind of deals they have. You know, but it's, as, a, as a sound producer, it's, t it's tempting because they, you know, hey, get this plug in, get this, get this VST, get this, get that, get this AU plug in it'll make you sound like yeah and it's never ending man yeah never ending no. so it's not about but it's not about the gear it's about the ear sure. Who's, was that miles davis somebody some famous artist said that it's not about the gear it's about the ear it's so right man good engineers can do more with a four track than somebody with a 10 ear with all the equipment in the world and not just engineering i mean even you know, uh, a guitar you know you don't have to buy a ten thousand uh, dollar les paul custom gibson custom shop les paul or right. or whatever your flavor would be i mean uh we've talked about this before but i the 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 when you see the gear rundowns by the the best players they often don't even know what they're playing that they when they do they usually don't when the premier guitar does it, and I love watching those videos because I learn a lot and uh, helps with my gear lust. You know, I got to get this one. Oh, so-and-so, you know, uh, uh, says there, um, Bramhall, uh, Daryl Bramhall, the second, says that this is the best uh, um, Shin A, um, what, did, what was the, the, I can't think of it, that Hendrix loved to use. The Univibe. Univibe, yeah. The best Univibe is Shin A, which I think originally made the Univibe. But it costs $1,300. Daryl Brimehall says that's the one to get. And according to the patch, it sounded really, really good, too. But it's $1,300. And the pedal is huge. If you try to put it on your pedal board, it would take up half your pedal board. Um, so. That's big money, man. $1,300, you can get a guitar and an amp. Yeah. Good ones. And make it go. It's just a never ending sea, man. You can spend millions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, on that stuff. And there's guys that do. But a lot of the ones that I, you know, of course, Brian Hall, you know, he's a great player and a great writer. And, uh, you know, his dad played drums with, with uh, Stephen Ray's brother, if I remember right. Uh, and he was a bit younger, but he hung out with all those guys. He's played with Clapton. He toured with Clapton for a couple of years. He and Daryl, uh, Daryl, or uh, Derek Trucks, uh, toured with Clapton as a guitar player. Uh, now he's probably a little more guitar savvy. This one that I watched was the gear rundown for Kenny Wayne Shepherd, Johnny Lang. It was all blues rock guys. Kenny Wayne Shepherd, Johnny Lang, uh, Daryl Bramhall, and uh, a woman. I can't think of it. A lot of them weren't that sophisticated, you know. They didn't really, you know. This is not that, not that, not into boutique gear, you know, like Boss pedals or whatever. Right. Uh, it's run of the mill stuff. Still sounded great, obviously. But Ram Hall was one who definitely was. You could tell he was a connoisseur of pedals. He had uh, pedals I'd never heard of, and uh, was really, really into it. So. You know, yeah, a lot of the blues guys, man, go the other direction where they're just like, you know, get a good tube amp. Pretty simple. Yeah, I like uh, you t that story you tell about uh, Buddy Guy. Yeah, man. Go ahead. 
Yeah, and I and I met him at the Blues Fest in Indy, and he was being polite, talking to me. And I said, what kind of, uh, or he said, what kind of rig do you have? Because I told him, I said, I'm a guitar player too, and I have a blues band. And he said, well, what kind of rig do you have? And I said, I've got a Fender Strat and a, and a Tweed Bassman. I said, because I try to catch capture that tone that you had on the old chess recordings. And he said, I didn't have an F and Bassman during those days. And I said, well, what did you use? And he said, I used whatever I get my hands on. And then he kind of chuckled. He said, I don't even know if I owned a Strat. So it wasn't, you know, it never was Those about recordings uh, hold up today. Those chess recordings, you know, they're doing it on. Oh, yeah, on the yeah they sound great, man. Those, you know, the guitar sounds are as good as anything. Yeah, yeah. And who knows? It was probably a silver tone guitar plugged into a toaster or something stupid <laughs> like that. Who knows what he was using? He didn't remember. So I don't, I don't think it's that big of a deal. He could take whatever you handed him and plug it in and make it sound just like that now. Yeah. But so you're right, man. It's more in the ear and the hands. Our new kitten is trying to destroy my light right now. Um. Let's see. That's not Chloe. Chloe is the older one that uh, that hates the fact that we got a kitten. Yeah. Chloe yeah. wants to get away from her all the time. Right. What's the young one name? With the name? Bowie. 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 Fired out of a cannon, man. <laughs> well, thing doesn't stop. It's trying to take out my light right now. It's like dangling. I love. I'm like. I'm like. I like being a, a pet grandparent. I like yeah. Them. But I get like to leave them behind when I leave. Right, right. Especially Emma. Man, I have the sweetest dog, and she, and she loves you to death. Oh, I love Emma too, but I think living with her every day. Yeah. And getting that kind of a attention and uh, a little too much too much affection. Well, uh, she 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 wakes you. You got to keep your bedroom door shut. Or she'll come in and wake you up, and then she'll leave. So one thing yeah. she now she'll stay with you. She she sleeps with you. Yeah. But she, then okay, it's two in the morning. I gotta make sure you're here. Just checking on yeah. everybody. Get on you, making sure you're here. She does then, the same exact thing to the kids. I can always tell because at Memphis and they they always make sure their doors are shut because she will go in there and wake them up like every hour on the hour, like she's just checking to make sure everybody's all right. A little mother hen. Uh, great dog. Yeah, man. All right. Well, it's 43 minutes. We've gained and lost like two or three or four followers like five times. Uh, so when our content is not enough to keep them engaged. But it comes uh, and goes, man. Goes, comes and goes. All right, everybody. Until next time. See you next time, Jimmy D and the Wolf podcast. See you, buddy. Yeah.